we're working on a path to a goal. It's important that we keep reminding ourselves of that, because all too often we want the goal right away and would like to dispense with the path as quickly as possible, get straight to the, the peace and freedom that the Buddha promises. But his promise is dependent on the path. If you don't follow the path, or actually it's the path is a series of qualities you actually foster in the mind. We don't walk anywhere on the path. But you foster these qualities in the mind, and you follow them to see where they take you as you foster them. Just as the road to the ocean doesn't look like the ocean, the path doesn't look like the goal. The path is something you have to fabricate, You have to some, something you have to put together. The goal is unfabricated. And the path requires a lot of things that you're going to abandon once you reach the goal, it's like desire. The Buddha's definition of right effort is that you generate the desire to do what's skillful and to abandon what's unskillful. There's nowhere where he denigrates the role of desire in the path. In fact, there are many places where the, the role of desire is actually emphasized. There are two suttas where Ananda is talking. In one case, uh, Brahman comes to see Ananda and says, where does this path go? What's, what are the results of this path that you're following? And Ananda says that one of the results is that you go beyond desire. And the Brahman says, well, what is this path? How do you get there? And Ananda says that you give rise to the four bases of power, one of which is based on desire. The Brahman immediately complains, says, how can you use desire to get beyond desire? And Ananda, in turn, asks the Brahman, when you came here, Ananda was staying in a park, when you came here to this park, before you got here, didn't you have the desire to come here? Well, yes. If you didn't have the desire, would you have gotten here? No. And then what happened to the desire once you got here? Well, once I got here, there was no need for the desire anymore. And it's the same way. You use the desire on the path. It's like driving a car down the road to the ocean. Once you get to the ocean, you don't drive the car into the ocean. You leave the car there at the end of the road. It's delivered you there. It's done what it had to do, and that's when you don't need it anymore. It's another case where a nun is talking to a nun. It makes a similar point. We practice to put an end to craving, but we need craving to get to that point. In other words, you hear that other people have done this and you want to have the same results. So it's not that desire is bad, it's just you have to learn how to use it properly. There are skillful desires and unskillful desires. The skillful desires are focused on the path for the sake of the goal. To make another analogy, it's like driving to a mountain on a horizon. If you spend all your time looking at the mountain while you're driving, what happens? You drive off the road. You have to focus your attention on the road. And even though the road doesn't look like a mountain, it'll take you there. So there's work to be done on the path. We can't let our impatience get in the way. This is one of the problems of our American educational system. It reward, rewards people who get everything right the first time. And for those who don't get it right the first time, there's not much explanation. They're just, you're just marked down. Makes you impatient. 
and it doesn't teach you the steps. Well, how do you get it right if you didn't understand it the first time around? All the people who got, got the Buddha's message right the first time around, they've all gone to nirvana. They've all succeeded on the path. We're the ones who are left over, which means we're the sort of people who have to follow the path step by step by step, because the steps are important. They teach us sensitivity. They teach us understanding. And if you try to rush through them, you're missing the two big qualities that you need in order to get awakening, sensitivity and understanding. So focus on the steps. And work on developing that sensitivity. This, this, is, this comes from the fact that this is a path is a middle way. If we were an extreme path, like an extreme sensual pleasure or extreme self-denial, it wouldn't require that much sensitivity. You just push, push, push in whichever direction is extreme. And that would get you there. The middle path requires a lot more precision, a lot more sensitivity. What is just the right amount of effort? This is another aspect of right effort. It's interesting when the Buddha talks about right effort in different con in different contexts. He emphasizes a different emphasizes different issues. Sometimes the issue is how much effort is appropriate. You can push yourself until you're ragged and not gain awakening, and then go swinging back in the other direction. Say, well, I'll just hope for an effortless path. And that doesn't work either. And most people give up right there. They've tried the two extremes, what they think are the two alternatives, and they haven't explored that murky land in the middle where you can negotiate the issue. Okay, what is the, precisely the right amount of effort right now? Because in some cases it's the question of well, what effort is appropriate right now? How much effort is appropriate right now? Those are two different questions. The how much effort? He says there are some cases where all you have to do is look at an instance of greed or anger or delusion in the mind. And as soon as you see it, it weathers away. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is just see it. The seeing is the doing, and that's all the doing that's needed. Other times it doesn't work. You have to take it apart. This is called exerting a fabrication. And this requires that you understand the different elements that go into this process. The mind's fabricating something. On the one hand, there's the breath, and this is one of the reasons why we focus on the breath. The breath is an intentional project, an inten intentional process. And we look at the breath so we can gain a sense of our own intentions. And then we learn how to modulate them and adjust them so we can breathe in a way that feels really good, that feels refreshing to the body. This is the right use of desire. You want the body to feel good inside, to strengthen it when it feels weak, to relax it when it feels tense, to wake it up when you feel sleepy. The breath has those potentials, and you have to explore them and learn from trial and error. So at some point you can get trial and success. This is where the quality of patience comes in. Your ability to judge the results of your efforts and notice, okay, this is not what I want. What can I do to make it more like what I want? This takes time, and, it's, and it, but it develops sensitivity. Because how do you know what kind of breathing is good or not unless you compare lots of different breaths? and lots of different ways of focusing on the breath. That's called physical fabrication. Then there's verbal fabrication, the things you choose to think about and the comments you make on them. It's called directed thought and evaluation. For instance, if you see greed arising. You can ask yourself, well, why am I focused on that particular object? And why do I keep telling myself that it's really desirable? Try to change your attitude toward it. Look for its undesirable side. And 
where you find yourself wanting to run away from the world, saying everything in the world is horrible. Well, that's unskillful as well. Lots of delusion right there. Lots of aversion. So you have to, have to ask yourself, is everything horrible? The Buddha said there are four noble truths. There is suffering, but there's an end to suffering, and there's a path to the end of suffering. Those are the good things in the world. And the path involves right action, right speech. It's not just sitting here and meditating with your eyes closed, but it's engaging with other people in a skillful way. Again, this requires sensitivity, and there's going to be lots of trial and error, but you have to learn to be patient with the trial and error. That's how you learn. And finally, there's mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions. The perceptions are the labels you put on things. This is good, that's bad. I like this, I don't like that. This is permanent, that's impermanent. Sometimes the trouble comes from putting the wrong labels on things. So ask yourself, well, what, what is this precisely that I'm worked up about? If you see, say, an object that's going to, you think is going to make you happy, or a person is going to make you happy, well, just ask yourself, where did I get that label? And is that a genuine, true label of description of what's actually going on here? what this person is, what this thing is. If the label is causing greed, there's something wrong with it. Can you label it a thing in a way that doesn't cause greed? Learn how to change the labels around until you've got something that doesn't get the mind all worked up. All of this is called exerting a fabrication. This is how you make an effort to disentangle yourself from unskillful states of mind. You see the way you're breathing around it, you see the way you're thinking about it, evaluating it. And then you look at the labels that give rise to pleasure or pain around that thing. That's the kind of exertion that sometimes is needed to disentangle yourself from an unskillful state of mind. So that's one issue, how much effort is needed. The second issue is what effort is needed. Some things the Buddha said, you simply have to learn how to comprehend. In other words, sit with them long enough until you understand them. For instance, the Four Noble Truths. You have to learn how to sit with suffering, sit with stress, sit with pain, until you understand exactly what is it about the pain that is so burdensome. Where is it coming from? Here we're talking mainly about pains in the mind, thoughts that make you uncomfortable, thoughts that make you suffer. Look for the suffering, and then ask yourself, well, what is it about this that's actually causing the suffering? Is it the thought itself, or is it the way I relate to the thought? Is there any craving in the way I relate to it? what comes and goes with the suffering, because the suffering doesn't stay all the time. Sometimes it comes, sometimes it goes. Stress might be a better word here than suffering. Suffering gets, makes it too big and romantic. But there's stress coming and going in the mind all the time. Notice when it's there, when it's not. And so you can see what comes with it and is causing it. You let that go. You don't let go of the stress, you let go of the cause the ignorance and the craving and whatever else is causing it, the clinging. Now, to do this requires patience and strength, and this is where the, the path comes in. You're trying to develop qualities of right mindfulness, right effort, right concentration as you're sitting here. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, those are taken care of simply by the fact that you're sitting here with your eyes closed. Those aren't issues at the moment. The real issues are how you're able to generate persistence so you can stay with the suffering long enough to watch it and see how it's connected with its cause. 
that requires concentration, because concentration is what gives you a sense of well-being inside, so you don't feel oppressed by the suffering. When you feel oppressed by it, all you can think about is either pushing it away or trying to run away from it. And in neither way do you understand it. And if you don't understand it, you can't let it go. Even though you try to run away, it follows you. It's like your shadow. You may not like your shadow, so you run away from it, but it keeps right there at your feet. So we develop concentration and all the desire and clinging that goes around concentration, because it does require desire. You have to want to do it. You have to learn how to hold on to it once you've got it. So you can use it as your foundation. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha said you need desire on the path, because you're not going to develop good, solid concentration without desire. So that's something you develop. Again, you don't just simply watch concentration come and go. Once it comes, you try to say, how can I maintain it? When it's not here, you say, well, how can I give rise to it? And maintaining involves sometimes going through the boring sections. The concentration's there, and all of a sudden you say, well, enough of that, what's next? That's when you've got to learn how to question that voice that says, well, enough of that. Why do you believe that voice? voice is part of the cause of suffering, so that's what you want to see. So this is another area where the question of right effort comes up, is exactly which kind of effort is called for right now. Because if you apply the wrong kind of effort to the wrong place, you end up not getting results at all. The Buddha has a nice analogy. He says it's like trying to milk a cow by squeezing its horn. You squeeze a little bit and the milk doesn't come out. So you squeeze it harder and the milk still doesn't come out. You squeeze it still harder. And all you're doing is harassing the cow. You're never going to get any milk that way. You have to apply the right effort to the right place. In other words, you squeeze the udder the milk comes out. So right effort is a matter of both of the right amount of effort and the right type of effort directed to the right place at the right time. All those things come together to create right effort. And it involves the desire to focus on the path, to do the path properly, the persistence to stick with it, to be patient, to take the time that's needed. And then the intent to be really sensitive to what you're doing and the what results you're getting. All of that together is right effort. So it's something that's going to take time, sensitivity. This is why we have to be patient with the path. If you're not patient with it, you just run roughshod over it and nothing happens. You've destroyed it. It's like coming to a spot in the road and saying, I'm tired of this road, I want the ocean. And so you stop and you just dig a big hole in the road. Well, one that doesn't get you to the ocean. And even if there does water does appear, it just makes it worse. It makes it harder that much that much harder to get across that patch of the road. So if we want peace, we have to work at the path. Sometimes the work is peaceful, sometimes it's not. But it's always good work. And if you approach it with understanding and patience, you find that it really does get you to where you want to go. We're here on land. We can't take the ocean to get to the ocean, but you can take the road to get to the ocean. So 
So learn to have a desire for the road. So you know when you've gone off to the left, gone off to the right. It's a famous passage from John Chai. So sometimes he sees people going off to the right of the road, so he says, go left, go left. Other times he sees people going off to the left, he says, go right, go right. The words seem contradictory, but they're for specific people and specific problems at specific times. So our duty as meditators is when we listen to the Dharma, figure out, go, where am I? Which part of the Dharma talk do I need to listen to right now? And which part can I save for later? Because it's all aimed at the path. And it's going to be your job to figure out when you're falling off to the right, when you're falling off to the left, and when you've turned around or heading backwards. So you can become your own self-corrector and keep heading forward. until you finally get to the goal.